Hey, Broads and Books listeners, you obviously have good taste in podcasts, so I think you'll appreciate In the Atelier, another podcast for book-loving, creative people just like you. Each installment of In the Atelier brings you an artfully produced audio essay dealing with some aspect of the creative life, or with literature, or film, and always with the aim of providing mindful and inspiring content that you can take with you into your week. Find In the Atelier on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, and welcome to Broads and Books. I'm Amy. And I'm Erin, and this is episode number 70. I'm a man. I'm a man. I am a man. Obviously, we are not um, <laughs> identifying as men. But no, we're not. This comes from a song by the band Pissed Jeans. <laughs> and yes, that's how it's spelled. P-I-S-S-E-D. As in I pissed my jeans. As in I pissed my jeans. I chose this because A, I think the song is hilarious. It is. It's from the perspective of sort of a gross pickup guy trying to pick up an office lady mm-hmm. i even wrote a few lyrics that i can share with you oh good okay good just to get a feel yeah people. yeah yeah hey office lady i see you there with your rolodex you know what i'm gonna do for you i'm gonna change out this water jug one-handed but first i'm gonna spill a few drops onto your lap and dab them up with this powerful organ in my mouth and by that i mean my tongue <laughs> because i'm a man yeah. <laughs> It's it's actually really great. <laughs> and if you've ever worked in an office as a female, oh you you right away, probably even prior to listening to the song, you'll get an image oh, in your head of you will that get guy. It. That guy. This song is written for, for that sure. guy. Sure. There's mm-hmm. even a phone on a belt for this guy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But I I love too that this is this is a band of four dudes. Yes. But this song was actually written and performed by a short story and novel writer named Lindsay Hunter. That's Which I thought cool. was fantastic. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. And it makes sense that she nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she's mm-hmm. probably dealt with a few of these douches yeah, in her life. Think. Yes. And, you know, I picked this song, obviously, because it's funny and, and great and all mm-hmm. that. But also, I think we've talked a lot about picks with women dealing with, you know, the horrors of sexism and patriarchy. We haven't necessarily talked about how sexism and patriarchy is a huge disservice to guys. Yes. Too. Yeah. You know? That if we are teaching our men to be tough, to be entitled, to be a man, mm-hmm. that's uh, that's going to, you know, it's not going to be great for them. No, absolutely not. Yeah. So I, I figured it was time. It, it was, was time, time to talk about it. It was time. Well, thinking about masculinity and mm-hmm. kind of the gender bias that exists, is there a time that your gender or femininity was questioned because of some part of your personality, like something that you do or don't like to do? I think... I'm thinking particularly in high school, but then also in my 20s, I kind of played into the notion of me being like a girl that was different from other girls. Okay. You know, like, Mm -hmm. oh, I had guy friends and I liked guy things and oh, I'm not the high maintenance girls Mm. like other girls. Mm -hmm. And what I only realized as I got older is that's sort of an anti-woman sentiment. It's not like, you know. Yeah. Yeah me being lauded for who I am it's me being like like a backhand compliment oh you're not like women because women are terrible you're slightly less terrible (laughs) right yeah (laughs) yeah absolutely so I felt I think for a while I felt like well this is a way for me to be you know known or to be different or, or something and yeah, only after reading some of the books that we've read did I realize I am being, uh, I'm not a feminist. I'm being anti-feminist right now. Right. Like I'm somehow pitting myself in competition with other women. Right. And that's bullshit. It is, but it's very easy to do it's because it's, to it's, do. it's our kind of what we're taught. So it's mm-hmm. the natural default position. You don't even realize it sometimes without yeah. really looking at the actions. And in that way, you're prioritizing supposedly what men are and men things as being better, as being superior. Yes. yes. Which we know that's not true. It's just not true. It's not true. No, no it's just not true. Erin, was mm-hmm. there a time when you were a kid that you remember being told that you couldn't have something or do something because you were a girl? Yes. I want to hear about it. (laughs) So, and he turned out to be a good friend of mine. I'm just going to preface this before (laughs) I tell the story. But he, um, oh gosh, it was elementary. I want to say it was like third grade, fourth grade. And this um, 
boy that was in my class said that there was females weren't as fast as guys like they oh. were just never going to run as well and they right. were just never going to be as fast it's just that's just the way it is just physics just, just science you know yeah just science mm-hmm. just how our bodies were made and i took offense to that without i think in my third grade brain without totally fully forming the thought you mm-hmm. know you're just like that doesn't sound right but i can't quite put my finger on why right and then I also decided that I was going to be the one that was going to prove that wrong, which is a terribly <gasps> misguided notion because I am in, never have been a runner. Oh, you assumed the whole cause of feminism yes. upon your shoulders. I didn't understand that you could take up a cause, then find someone else to further your cause in a better way. <laughs> that you had to be the mm-hmm. runner that would defy all of this. Yes. So we set up a date for a foot race. Oh, no. And it was going to be after, you know, rec- it was going to be recess. It was going to be after lunch. I remember that day. I was very nervous. Nervous. I didn't eat anything because somehow in that in my head that was going to be better to just not eat. Um, I remember thinking and trying to like psych myself up with all kinds of quote unquote runner thoughts, whatever those are. <laughs> Do you remember any of the runner thoughts? No, I just oh. know that I had no actual training. So I don't no. know what I was trying to accomplish okay. in those 10 minutes prior to this race. Okay. I think we all know the outcome. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we just, mm-hmm. I got beat terribly. Did you stay upright during the whole run? I did. Oh, well, I that's did. a win. I did. I did. But I think I remember that being like, okay, but I'm still right. (laughs) But I couldn't figure out how to form that thought because I lost. (laughs) Right. You were not representative of the entire gender at that moment. No, I just, I didn't think it through enough to find the fastest girl in our class to put up against this person. Mm -hmm. I thought that I had to take it on. Like, why did I do that? Yeah. Which is another thing that can happen with masculinity is it can like you said pit women against women yes and then we're we think we're an island and if we had all joined together we could have figured out who could beat this kid at a foot race and i know there was someone there that could have but then also someone had told that kid like an adult or something or another man had told that kid you know like boys are better at sports boys are better at this boys are more you know Mm -hmm. like men are better so he was just parroting probably what someone else said absolutely Mm -hmm. So that's a whole, you know, Mm -hmm. hopefully you said you were now friends. Yes, we were great friends in high school. Okay, He's a very wonderful person. And he, in no way do I think any of those views, like he would still hold. (laughs) He does not maintain this No, no. And he was Do you think he will do another foot race in the future? I will never do another. I have, that was the beginning and end (laughs) of my competitive running career. (laughs) So (laughs) leave that at the door. Oh man, that's such an image. Little third grade Aaron. Just running our heart out, trying to represent women. In a Catholic school girl uniform. (laughs) Oh, no. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. I think often about the fact that you revealed here on the podcast (laughs) that you really had no idea how to dress until you got to college. (laughs) And even then, I think I think we should safely say that it still took me a few years after college to really get a good grasp of, you know, you can have your own style. Mm -hmm. Like. I don't, you don't have to like A, what's popular because you don't know any better. Right. Or B, you don't have to wear khakis for every. What do boys thing. have to wear to Catholic school? Um, they wore cath- uh, khaki pants or navy blue pants, I believe. Oh, okay. We all had like uniform tops. Okay. But the jumpers, we had jumpers through fifth grade and I, they didn't have, I mean, they just and had jumpers pants. are sweaters? Nope, they're like a full, like a dress, but it's like, oh. you know, like you wear a shirt under it and it's oh. plaid. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay, got yeah. it. Like think Britney Spears. Oh, and, Oops, I did it again, wonderful. except it's a full jumper. Like, okay, you're pulling okay. it over your head. Mm-hmm. It's got a shirt. I always wear shorts under mine. I like that now the go-to way of describing the Catholic, Catholic schoolgirl school outfit is Britney Spears <laughs> and or Halloween costumes. Yes. And yes. slutty Catholic yeah, girls. That's another one. Yeah. Uh-huh, mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. They're terribly itchy and uncomfortable. I can tell you that. <laughs> I think that's designed oh, yes, that sir. way. Oh, yeah. So that you never forget about the Lord. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> you nailed right? it. Yeah. yeah. Well, do you think that it's possible to have masculinity without toxic masculinity? I don't know because I feel like there's toxic femininity too yeah, that we don't okay. necessarily talk about. I mm-hmm. think that there's a little bit of a difference. I feel like toxic masculinity is very directed at women. Mm-hmm. Toxic femininity in my mind is when you're sort of directing it at other women or yourself. You know, I'm thinking like okay. extreme diet yes. stuff and diet shaming, body shaming, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um I think there's toxic feminine, femininity in the women that vote against their gender for Trump and, you know, things like that. Mm-hmm. 
I, I think just honestly, any sort of feelings that we have about different genders, like men do this, women do right. this, I think it's all toxic. And I mm-hmm. feel like we need a reboot. We just need to stop. Yeah. Stop trying to ascribe certain traits and certain personalities to men or women, because as we've seen, mm-hmm. they do nobody good. Right. Yeah. You know? That's a, I like that. That's an interesting point that defining certain things as masculine or feminine in and of itself is sort of a toxic undertaking yeah. because you're naturally going to end up pitting people into those positions. Yeah. And in the world that we live in, um, and you know, some of the readings that you and I have done or uh, opportunities we've had to hear from other uh, viewpoints. I mean, I'm cisgender, Mm -hmm. so I don't have that viewpoint unless I read about it. And a lot of, I've, a lot of the things I've read from um, transgender writers have said that some of the biggest issues are people thinking that certain things yes. are feminine or certain things are masculine, or if they're you know transgender female, that somehow they're not as much of a woman because exactly. they don't have certain things or they exactly. don't do certain things. Yeah, and I feel like then it gives people almost permission to bodily, um, word wise, attack them. Yeah, so it just shows that. We're, we're trying to defend these notions of femininity and masculinity to an extreme, and it just all has to go. It's yeah. all stupid. And yeah. It's, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Agreed. Thank 100% you. 100% agreed. Thank you. Mm-hmm. But I, mm-hmm. I like that idea, too, especially talking to some of the people that we have. It's mm-hmm. really, um, it's demonstrated that, and it shows how much, too, we've talked about this, how representation matters. And when mm-hmm. you see in shows, in in uh, movies that women are one way, men are another. It just mm-hmm. reinforces the whole thing and it just keeps going and going. And mm-hmm. then we act it out in our lives and <sighs> mm-hmm. I'm just tired of it. Yeah. I'm tired of it, Erin. I am too. And speaking of that, how do you feel about Barbies? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to confess here that I used to love them. Yeah, I was an I did too. avid Barbie fan. I, I had mean, a Barbie I house. Had them. Yes. Barbie car. car. Yeah. I dressed them up. I did everything. Mm-hmm. And I will say it didn't take... I mean, I remember being aware of it, probably high school, college, you know, that there was some problems here. I think yeah. most females have heard, if not, you should have, that you know, Barbie's actual measurements, she wouldn't be able to stand up right. You know, things like that that you then hear down the road. But I don't remember ever actually taking it into context until I had a child, I think. And even Mm -hmm. though I have boys, I remember thinking you know, this, that is a weird thing to give a kid. I mean, what else are you going to do with the doll besides change it clothes and pretend for it to get married? Yeah. Like they're just, and so many, so much of it that's marketed is marketed in a way like it's a surprise. Like they tried to make it seem better by having Dr. Barbie and veterinarian Barbie, but those were like the exceptions. Like we had to make a special doll to make it obvious that she could be a doctor. We had to make a special doll to make it obvious that she could be a vet. Because general Barbie is nothing. Yeah. She's she's not. That's not a thing. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be doing anything. Mm -mm. So it's very, for me, that's, that's a, that's obviously a problem area and an area that it's a struggle because I remember having great memories as a kid playing with them. But now what I understand them to be is yeah. a whole different thing. Yeah. And it's just another way that we incorporate that without really taking any time to think about what it's doing. Mm-hmm. And I think now, I don't know if Barbies are as popular as they were then. I, I, have to I think there's that. other dolls, but yes. it's kind of the same thing mm-hmm. or, or even more so. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. It still always seems to kind of perpetuate that same idea, yeah. you know, that kind of dressing up and mm-hmm. almost, I guess, for, with Barbie for me is there's an element of, I'm like, I'm faking it. Like I'm dressing you yes. up as a doctor, but you can't actually be a doctor. Like we're just Ooh, playing pretend, you know? That's a good point. There's a very big element of fantasy there that I struggle with. Yes. Ah, oh, see, even Louise doesn't like that. Yeah. She is anti-Barbie. Yeah, good job. <laughs> chiming in point. I like it was it. also like a half yawn and a half meow. So that's how much she thinks about. Yeah, she can't even gender to norms. Give a full yawn. Yeah, bleh. she's like gender norms be damned. Exactly. I think that's a perfect time to start talking about our picks. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Yes. Do it. I t- <laughs> <laughs> was that. That was aggressive. Let's do it. Yeah, that was very manly. I right? was trying Is that- to be yeah, uh huh, a little more in your face with my. Meanwhile, Louise is getting very aggressive with the scratching post. So if you're hearing background noise, you probably won't. But you know, 
She, I like uh, it. She wants to make herself known in this episode about uh, gender. She already seems to have tired herself out. She, <laughs> she took two scratches and laid down on it. She's out. That's like every exercise yeah. I've ever tried to do right there in a nutshell. And I'm out. I mean, she's got nothing to prove. Yeah. So, good for you know, you. yeah. You do good what feels good for you. Yeah. She's like, I don't know why you're talking to me. This is weird. Like, this is getting weird. <laughs> <laughs> My fiction pick is one that I know you've read as well. It's called Any Man by Amber Tamblyn. I didn't even think of it for that. Oh, oh, I my thought for gosh. a minute that we might be picking. If the I same had thought one. of it, yeah. then it would be. But this book came nice. out in 2018, mm-hmm. and I think generally it just sort of flips the script on yes. all sorts of rape culture, on like what we teach men mm-hmm. versus women. Mm-hmm. So it's brilliant in that way. It centers sort of around. Uh, a woman named Maud, who is a serial female rapist who preys on men. And it's not some sort of revenge scenario. It's not no. anything like that. It's like this sort of topsy-turvy world where this happens versus what we construe as normal rape, mm-hmm. perhaps. Um, her victims are men, and they are very brutalized by the attacks. The first guy, Donald, um, he's a father and a husband, and it's such a brutal attack that it seems pretty cut and dry but when details from the night emerged that he'd been drinking, that he'd met a woman at the bar and he talked to her, even though he's married, the media is just rushing to like implicate him like, oh, this is your fault. Mm-hmm. You know, so we hear from him. We hear from other male victims who they all sort of feel ashamed of being a victim. They feel doubted by the police. They feel stalked by the woman who's still out there. No one's caught her. And they feel very sort of exposed and traumatized by media attention, which is airing all the details of the attacks Mm -hmm. and also sort of implying that, "Ah, I don't know if this really happened. Like these men might be hysterical. They might be like, you know, emotional and, Mm -hmm. you know, making this up. So it all sounds super familiar. Mm -hmm. Um, And I love that. I love that it feels so familiar, except it's completely alien. In, yeah. in, in the way that she writes it. Mm-hmm. And and she writes in different ways, too, which is great. There's some poetry in there. There's some prose. There's an extended, like, Twitter conversation slash debate, which is so, with, like, real people. It's amazing. Which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, in one, I saw this this week, she basically transcribed a Nancy Grace, like, panel discussion mm-hmm. um, where they were dissecting and doubting a rape survivor story and just flipped the gender. Mm-hmm. So it's like, this is actually it. And I chose for this theme because I think, like I said, by flipping the script, it sort of shows our rape culture in a way that maybe we haven't really thought about it before. Mm -hmm. Um, It shows like what we typically allow for men and how we teach men and how our culture sort of is set up and maintained by this, how it perpetuates and keeps dangerous ideas about masculinity and what men are entitled to. I read this like in one long go yes. on a flight to Vienna. And it was an amazing experience, a very intense experience it because is. of that. I know you read it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, did you read it or did you do the audiobook? I read it. You read yeah. it, okay. Because mm-hmm. I heard that the audiobook, it has like a number of actors playing oh, really? each of the roles. So that could oh. be a really cool experience if yeah. you're into audiobooks yeah. too. Um, what else did you think about it, Aaron? Oh, I thought, yeah, you. I mean, you nailed everything the way that I felt. Is that it? The script is so familiar, mm-hmm. but even for someone, I, I mean, obviously we're avid readers, yeah. So we yeah. should have a better understanding of how that should work for everyone. But even flipping the script, it was so hard for my brain to compute yes. and to feel like I could understand it in that context because mm-hmm. we never see it that way, right? And very interesting, and oddly has a lot to say on both sides of the coin about yeah. kind of what we were talking about at the beginning about toxic masculinity and toxic femininity, yeah, for sure, and the ability that sometimes one or the other sort of gives a pass on certain behaviors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It's really good. I loved, one of the things I loved about the reading experience was all the different genres that are in so, there. And it's so, yeah, it's such a propulsive read in that way. Like you're just mm-hmm. drawn in both by the writing and then on the subject. Um, I also had a really incredible experience in that I got to read for Amber yes. Tamlin on her book tour. And the reason I bring that up is that I got to talk to her a little bit and it was the last stop on her tour. And she was telling me that it, 
this was such an emotional tour because like at every stop, men and women were coming up to her, telling her stories Mm -hmm. of, you know, attacks, of rape, of trauma. And it reminded me of some of our conversations with past authors of memoirs where this has been an experience. I mean, that's a lot to hold when you're writing. And she told me that like after the reading was done, she was going to go to her hotel room and cry for a few hours. And I was like, well, that sounds about right. Yeah. And you you deserve that cry. Yes. Go for it. And also, I just applaud that you are willing to tell me that. Yeah. And we've mentioned a few times in our ability, or you know, the wonderful gift we have to get to interview authors, that that's really the people that I get, like, starstruck by. Mm -hmm. So I have a very vivid memory of when you told me that you were going to read for Amber Tamlin, and I (laughs) may or may not have peed a little in my pants for you. Because I was so excited. Oh, thank you for the celebratory pee. You're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. I mean, in other, like in a Dateline situation, that would mean you did something terrifying yeah. to me and I mm-hmm. peed my pants. Nope. But in this nope. situation, it's it was pure great. Pure excitement. Yeah. yeah. Pure excitement. It, it was one of those situations where like I was super excited too, but it didn't feel real until suddenly yeah. I'm in this weird back room at the bookstore and I'm waiting for Amber Tamlin and I'm like, I don't, oh, okay. And she walks in and she's like way shorter than I thought she was going to be. And I <laughs> hugged her and I was like, I'm so giant. Yeah. And you're so little. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah it was it was pretty great it was. and wonderful book it is it's yeah. terrific yeah and I also devoured it in one sitting because it's kind of like that not on a flight thank god because it was too into I would have struggled it was with an that. overnight flight and yeah. I was like Ooh. oh yeah Ooh. I need to sleep but nope not sleeping now Ooh. not doing it yeah Mm-mm. my fiction pick this week oh it's called imperfect women Ooh. by Arminetta Hall who oh. we read Our Kind of Cruelty. Yes. We both okay. read that book. Yeah. I recommended it um, previously. Yeah. This is her new book. It was just published in June of 2020. Ooh, okay. Um, I fell in love with her reading style, so I wanted to get on this book right away, and I'm very glad I did. Um, very different book. This book follows three friends, um, and each section of the book is told from one of the three friends' viewpoints. So it's Nancy, Eleanor, and Mary. And each of them sort of represents some sort of typical female path, like, No kids, one kid, lots of kids, really big career, had to give up her career for family, struggling to find her place. Kind of these things that we, these pigeonholes we put women into frequently. At the very beginning of the book, you find out that Nancy was murdered. And it immediately comes to light that she was having an affair, which Mm -hmm. is shocking because her husband's like this perfect guy. Like Eleanor, one of the best friends, is just sort of, appalled by the whole thing she's known for almost a year that there was an affair going on but she ends up dead they're pretty sure it was this guy but they don't know how to find who he is because nancy hasn't given anyone any details so we're we're finding out all these secrets and all these things that are becoming unburied from each of the women's different viewpoints um and you know right away you you get the impression that nancy's like one of those perfect women you know appears Mm -hmm. perfect she's got this great husband she's got a wonderful daughter everything seems to be great and you are sort of fed that until you read the section from her point of view, which is very interesting. And this, I I will say, I think that this book is a big story about female friendship in a lot of ways. It could also be considered a book about toxic femininity and not even within close friendships about how sometimes we can't see things from someone else's perspective, that we're sure we understand why they're making those decisions or you don't understand me because you don't have this, that, or this, and I don't understand you because you haven't made these decisions. So I'll say that. But the other reason that I picked it this week is because there's a couple men at the center of this story that are central to some of the secrets that come out okay. and how the women choose to deal with that and how they choose to move forward and the things that they think and how they feel. And to me, it's a really good example of how we teach men that that's their place, mm-hmm. that whatever they think and feel should be center yes. and everyone else can react around them. Uh-huh. And in context of our theme this week, the disservice that that does is that they think that they're more important than they are. Yes. Or they think they have more control than they do. So they're... And then when they don't have that control, yes. they can react and yeah. spin out. Yeah. And some of them, they can react terribly, violence, that type of thing. But for some of them, it's so emotional, they can't recover because yeah. um, Nancy's husband is a great example because there's supposed to be this strength there and he doesn't have it. He just wasn't prepared to deal with anything like this in his life because everything's gone according to plan. Mm-hmm. So he's sort of in this vast ocean of emotion that he can't get through because he doesn't have the tools to do it. Mm-hmm. So I think it, I, I liked it for that because I think it does a great job of illustrating that theme but 
I also think that it has a lot to say about how men deal with women who are different than their own viewpoints of what a woman should be. A woman that chooses a career, a woman who's smart, a woman who is accomplished. I think there's a lot to say in there about that. And I don't, I can't get into it too much without giving away some of the twists, but it just, there's so many examples of that in this book. And they're almost a little bit like Amber Tamlin's book Mm -hmm. where it's so familiar. Yes. But when you look at it through a different context, you're like, why is that? Why is it that right. way? And mm-hmm. isn't that the beauty of that kind of writing? It's yes. like, wait a second. Like, I've just kind of lived with this my mm-hmm. whole life, but now I'm seeing it for the weirdness that it is. Exactly. And one of the things, one of the central themes and that comes from Eleanor that I really stuck with me from this book is this idea that women hold guilt and shame all the time in every situation when they come out of a situation whatever feelings or emotions they feel responsible for everyone involved they carry it they carry the worry they carry the guilt they carry the shame they're sure that somehow they could have changed it or done something different because that's what we're taught if yeah. something went wrong we were probably involved somehow yep. and we got to fix it yes. we have to handle it absolutely yeah. mm-hmm. and i lo- and they are really challenging that idea in this book that why do why are the women the ones that have to carry the guilt and shame mm-hmm. and in that context, if you take that out of there, what a disservice that we do to everyone around us when that's what we're focused on mm-hmm. and is sort of a way to get us to not focus on the right things or not, you know, pay more attention to what we have to offer. Yeah. Uh, it's really good, really quick read because you got a mystery, you know, at the heart of it. So you're kind of getting to find that, but also reading the book from those three different women's viewpoints and finding out what was going on in their life and these three friends who are supposed to be so close and the things that they tell each other, but then the things that they realize they don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, And I love the title when I got done because I thought that's so perfect because imperfect women, well, couldn't you could just have it be called women. Uh, Right. I mean, yeah, but it's pointing it out. That is so great. I, um, interesting because I started thinking about her other book Our yeah. Kind of Cruelty mm-hmm. and that could have been a fantastic pick for this as well Yes, but then it got me thinking like there were so many books that we've already talked about that would be fantastic for yes. this because in some way they deal with uh, mm-hmm. men being somehow you know mm-hmm. either an actor or something that shows that the disservice that we've done yeah. in teaching them absolutely yeah. yes 100% also yeah. can I call out a turn of phrase that I really liked that you just said yeah a vast ocean of emotion <laughs> I was like, I got to write that shit down. Vast ocean of emotion. Vast ocean of emotion. No shame in my game. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. (laughs) I just uh, wanted to point it out. I didn't even realize how much that rhymes. It sounds like I'm starting an 80s ballad. Oh my God. I wonder what the title of that 80s ballad is. Would it be Ocean of Emotion? Oh yeah. It'd have to be, right? Ocean of Emotion? Yeah. Oh my God. That sounds like a hit. That's every high school dance's theme song. Ocean of Emotion. Ocean of Emotion. Yep. Screw you, Titanic theme. Ocean of Emotions coming in. <laughs> oh, oh Aaron, who knew you were a songwriter too? I mean, I'm multifaceted. Multifaceted. <laughs> Let me exactly. just tell you that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting that you had a little bit of poetry because my other genre pick is a poem. Or not a poem, a poetry <laughs> collection. I was like, it's not a what poem. One poem! <laughs> I wrote you one, one poem! Single. I'm not going to overwhelm you with pages this week. You get one poem. It's a collection a of collection poems, plural. Poems. Yes. Hit me with it. Okay. It's called Don't Call Us Dead oh. by Denez Smith from yeah, 2017. Yeah, don't do it. Um, I think that both you and I probably don't read a lot of poetry, mm-hmm. but this is the kind of poetry that I love. It's super visceral. It's mm. very real. It's very gripping. The first portion is one long sort of extended poem that Ooh. imagines an afterlife for murdered black boys. Wow. I mean, here's a couple lines. Yeah, from it. So you get sort of a feel yeah. for it. Here there's no language for officer or law, no color to call white. If snow fell, it'd fall black. Please don't call us dead. Call us alive someplace better. We say our own names when we pray. We go out for sweets and come back. Uh, Now, first off, Denise Smith is also a uh, performer, like a spoken word performer. He's fantastic. So that was terrible what I just did. But it was (laughs) because they say it with, uh, you know, beauty and power and everything. Mine was a very mediocre reading. But you get the point of the words. Yes, Yes. uh, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, It was still very powerful, the words. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And another portion, he writes about being queer 
but also living with an HIV diagnosis. Mm. So how you can be young and in love and lust and still live with this sort of hanging over your head. Yeah. So it's beautiful, heartbreaking stuff. And I chose for this theme because a lot of it deals with boys and what can happen to boys like him and what that does to their psyche. Mm -hmm. Like boys that are growing up black know they could die for the slightest things, Mm -hmm. right? There's a long history of lynching, long history of incarceration, of police killings. So they have that hanging over their heads as Mm -hmm. they grow up. Um, it's this, you have to create this sort of strange sense of living carefully yet still live as a boy, still Mm -hmm. try to have fun as a boy and boys that grow up queer in a world dominated by, you know, manly white men can also die or be brutalized because they're not fitting those standards of masculinity because they're not being man enough because Mm -hmm. other boys feel like they have to defend what they are with violence. Right. And to top it all off, you have an HIV diagnosis, and that changes your notion of manliness, Mm -hmm. perhaps, as well. Mm -hmm. So I I really like this as a picture of growing up male and what the combination of race and sexuality do to that, and just how complicated masculinity really is, Mm -hmm. but we're not teaching it that way. Right. You know? So yeah, very powerful. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of, because you mentioned, you know, both of us were not huge poetry readers, which is true, but um, I'm reminded of what uh, Matthew Kaye said that really when you're reading, you're reading poetry. Yeah. Like anything that anybody wrote, any line, I mean, they've spent a lot of time on that and essentially it's poetry. It's yeah. telling you something through putting those words together and... So I guess we do read a lot of poetry. I guess we do too. And also I have his voice going in my head sometimes when I'm trying to write again because it's been a while mm-hmm. and, you know, I'm kind of struggling getting back into it. And then in my head, I'm thinking, Matthew Kaye thinks we're all poets. So I'm going to be a poet. You can be a poet. <laughs> yes. And you know what else? We also learned that we're art collectors. So if it takes God you a it, long time, are. no one says to the sculpture artist that we can't believe that took you five years yeah. to create. That's right. So if it takes you five years to create, then it does. Then it does. Because it's art. (laughs) So. Yes, it's our self-affirmation Wednesday. Yes. I was like so confused (laughs) because we're not recording on a Wednesday. Did you see that? Yeah, you did. You're like, wait, what? When's Wednesday? the wrong pair of underwear I was trying to... (laughs) The wrong day. <laughs> I was trying to look ahead to our release day. Yeah. Be current you with were, our listeners' good. ears. What, what you did yeah. was good. What I did not so Thank good. Thank you. Not prepped. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> it is in fact Wednesday. <laughs> um, well, I picked a short story collection called Things to Make and Break by May Lantan. Mm. Um, it's a collection of short stories. It was published in 2014, and it was published by the Emily Book imprint of Coffee House Press, oh, which yeah. I have very much fallen in love with. Um, also, by the way, short note, Coffee House Press right now is donating um, a portion of all profits from their website sales to the National Bailout Initiative. Oh my God. Right. So now is a great time yeah. to stock up on some books from Coffee House Press. And they don't just have the Emily Books part. They have tons of other yeah. fiction. They have tons of other essays, poems, merch, all kinds of things. That's so, fantastic. Yeah. And that's a great way that you could get something for yourself and be giving back if mm-hmm. you like that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, all of the short stories in this collection involve the making or breaking of a relationship. Mm. So we're either seeing the relationship before they break up or we're seeing it just as it first forms. Um, One of my favorites is about this woman who finds an envelope of nude photos in her boyfriend's desk and she realizes that it's one photo for each of his exes. Each of his exes is depicted in a nude photo. So... I loved this story because I thought I knew where it was going. Mm-hmm. But what happens is she gets sort of obsessed with one of these women and really no way to sugarcoat it starts stalking her to oh, understand. And it, it's never come out and said, but you get this sort of very deep feeling that she's trying to understand how they all connect. Like yeah. what is, why is it me right now right. when it was this person or why was it this person in this other photo that I see? And then this person, Which there's I like this, it, that's such a universal feeling. Like it is. How, yeah. Yes. Why does someone choose me? Why does, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Or, and especially, I think that that's a very, um, female thing sometimes yes. to feel as though we're 
comparing ourselves to yes. past females we like, have to well, be better than past girlfriends yes. we have to be better than yeah yeah. Uh-huh. yeah oh she looked like that and i look like this so mm-hmm. why what's the you know what's the hold up here what's the hang up so i loved that um and i love that idea of trying to go outside of herself to understand it instead of just having a conversation with her partner because I mean, no one would do that, right? No. We'd all feel terribly threatened and mm-hmm. like we'd be exposed. But yeah. it, that's such a great illustration of toxic femininity and toxic masculinity together mm-hmm. where it just prevents you from communicating because you're sure that that person isn't going to understand you or right. is going to be annoyed that you have these feelings. So I chose it for this theme because at the heart of a lot of the stories is the male's power and ability in being able to hold power in relationships Mm -hmm. and be able to be the one that can say, oh, that's stupid, we're not talking about that, or I don't care about that, kind of always wield the power and have a female sort of always trying to figure out what's going on. You know, they're taught at an early age a lot to hide emotions, keep things cold and distant, and that really leaves their partners feeling off kilter and grappling for their place. And that right there is such a a problem that we can see it on such a personal level. And I think anyone that's been in a relationship can relate to that. Uh, Communication is so central and can go so wrong so fast because it's hard to be vulnerable and talk about your emotions. And it's hard for females to do it, much less people, you know, who have been raised to say, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't. And don't you think like our notions of like, you know, women, we go into an argument knowing that we're going to be called emotional that we're going to be called hysterical yes. and men go in knowing they're probably going to be called commitment phobic or like right you know on yes. un- un- untouchable or whatever yeah yeah and and sometimes like the labels they're able to hide behind them mm-hmm. and we're trying to get away from them yes. it's it's yes. a very weird way that they serve on both sides Which, and by the way i contend that men are way more emotional than women potentially mostly in the fact that they aren't taught how to handle emotion. Yes. So when yeah. they have emotion, they lash out. Yes. Like freaking tantrums. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, we're taught, I guess, from an early age, for better or worse, mm-hmm. that our emotions, we can sit with them and how to sit with them. Mm-hmm. Whereas men are taught to bottle that shit up. It's so like when it does come out. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a slow leak of gas in your stove yes. <laughs> as compared to like the large that blew up my house in the whole block. <laughs> Like, it's a small thing. Let's deal with it, talk through it, and figure uh-huh. out how to fix it. It's fixable. Yeah. We can do that. The explosion where you just, there's pieces left, that's mm-hmm. harder to figure out. So. And since more men are in power, when mm-hmm. we see, like, men and their emotions coming out, it can, you know, wreck things on a big scale. Mm-hmm. I used to really be embarrassed that I was as emotional yes. as I am. Because yes. I am. I'm very, like, I can cry very easily. And I think not- that was a big part of me trying to show that I was not high maintenance that yes, I was more yeah. like guys because mm-hmm. you know I I don't want to be emotional I don't want right. to be all of that yeah yeah and I mean I can and I'm not even not crying I mean I can cry over personal things but even just silly things like commercials whatever yeah. but what I've decided is that I don't I, I've just stopped being ashamed of it because ultimately it means that I have empathy absolutely and I would much rather be someone who's considered over emotional and empathetic than someone who's not empathetic mm-hmm. because so much of what is going wrong right now in the dumpster fire that is 2020 yes is the fact that we can't seem to put ourselves in anybody else's shoes or yes. have any thought or feeling about how what someone else is going through even if it's not our own experience mm-hmm. we have So many people have no desire to understand anything outside of their world. And here's what we have. Yeah. And that's that's another thing we don't really teach men that's cool is to have empathy, Mm -hmm. to, you know, put yourself in other people's positions where we are taught that early on, mostly in the way of To serve males. To serve men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So the whole book kind of centers on that. It's really great. Um, I really liked her writing, like writing style. All those stories were a little bit different, um, kept my attention really well and Mm -hmm. thought for this theme, it really serves it when you're looking at interpersonal relationships and also Coffeehouse Press given charity. Get on it. Yeah. I love small presses. I do too. It's amazing. It's amazing. Well, pop culture, (laughs) I went all in and chose Mindhunter from netflix wow which started in 2017 another good pick for this you've seen this as well yeah we've talked about this yeah Yeah. so if you haven't heard about this um this show it starts in the late 1970s as a couple of fbi agents 
pretty much start the first profiling section mm-hmm. in the FBI. Mm-hmm. And they sort of name the phenomenon of serial killers. Up to this point, the, it, there wasn't, you know, vernacular for it. There wasn't anything like that. Their goal, these agents, is to try and figure out what makes some of these guys tick and provide a sort of blueprint for how to find and track them. So they talk to killers in prison about their motivations, about their experiences, like all of that kind of stuff. So it's a fascinating look behind the scenes at what the FBI was like in the 1970s, how I mean, from the start, you can see they were really kind of behind the ball on this. Like, they Mm -hmm. wanted nothing to do with psyche of people. Like, they're very much just law and order. We don't care about, Mm -hmm. you know, thinking too hard about this. Um, I think the show overall, it's so well done. It's created by David Fincher, uh, in part by David Fincher, um, who I love. Uh, And a really interesting casting choice, I think, in the main guy, the main agent, uh, casting Jonathan Groff, who's well, most well known probably for his Broadway roles, mm-hmm. which I think is really kind of a clever. Or for being Olaf. Or for being. Olaf. Oh no, he's not Olaf. He's he's the other guy. The... He's Kristoff. Right? Sure. Yep. yep. You know the names. Yeah. I he's don't the know blonde. Him. He's, he's Kristoff, who in Frozen Two has an amazing power ballad in the middle, <laughs> like '80s power ballad, which was fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm yeah, sorry. the guy that's singing yeah. power ballads yes, in Frozen Two. I apologize. It's Kristoff. Don't write me. I know Frozen. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was a mistake. I feel like Julia Phillips is going to be disappointed in Ooh, you right now. I know. I yeah. like as soon as I said Olaf, I was like, oh, oh no. take it back. It's oh, Kristoff. No. Sorry. Detour. Detour. <laughs> Uh, well, why I chose Mindhunter for this is I think that there's a ton of crime shows and true crime that that shows a lot of like men being killers and often killing women. And I feel like sometimes it kind of plays up that sort of lurid value. There's like a little bit of weird sexual stuff added mm-hmm. in. Here, you don't get that. You get a very close and upfront look at the guys who really just lean too hard into masculinity. In my mind, uh, yeah. all of the killers, they're talking about women as things, mm-hmm. things for them to play with, to rape, to kill. All of them point back to some interaction in their lives with women as an explanation for the way they are yes, today. Yes. Like either there was some women that were indifferent to them, wouldn't have sex with them. Women that were nagging them, you know, their moms just loved say, them mothers, too much. Yeah, exactly. Was a big part. Or, or somehow, didn't love them enough. Exactly. Somehow didn't treat them as superior. Mm hmm. So there's that, but even more so, I think the FBI itself is sort of filled with guys that talk about women this way. There's a mm-hmm. very much sort of this machismo kind of thing going on in the FBI at mm-hmm. this time. Um, so much that leadership is unwilling to consider that they do things wrong, that they need to change the way they do things. You know, it's very right. much like we are who we are and we're awesome and mm-hmm. all that. And one of the agents, the main guy, played by Jonathan Groff, he sort of starts to be influenced by the the masculinity of the mm-hmm. killers, by the way they talk about women, by the way they uh, behave, and it's not really checked. And so it gets into some real weird places, and you you start to worry for yes, this guy. You do, yeah. you do. Meanwhile, you know, there's women. There's a Harvard professor who's mm-hmm. basically the brains of the operation. Yeah. There's um, husbands or, excuse me, girlfriends and wives that, you know, just aren't really listened to much or appreciated mm-hmm. much. And I think overall it shows how easy it is to fall into this mm-hmm. and to, to be this way. Um, there was a fantastic Vulture review. And they said that Mindhunter becomes a window into the rot at the heart of the white American male. Mm. The series finds horror not by detailing the broken bodies of victims, but the banality of this misogyny and how easily it blooms. And bam. Yeah, bam is right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you, Okay, so you've seen it as well. What do you think? Yeah, I think I, I agree with all of that. I think um, one of the things that strikes me in terms of this theme is that you know, Jonathan Groff's character, they're they're trying some new things. Like you yes. said, the FBI is very set in their ways. This is how you handle these situations. We're trained for this. This is how you do it. And they're very unwilling to look at, while not, you know, we don't need to use it as an excuse what a lot of these serial killers did, but they're not willing to look at how we could prevent this, how we right. can stop it when it's happening right. by understanding the emotional components. Yes, that they go want into no it. part of that. Yeah, they don't yeah. want to, because to them that seems feminine or not tough enough. But in reality, if they actually did that, they'd be more successful at stopping these people before they became full on serial killers. Mm-hmm. Maybe instead of having five victims, they would have two yeah. or, you know, whatever it is. But they are very, 
it feels like in that show all the time butted up against yeah. that thought process. That's a good point because at one point they're touring around to police stations around the country kind of talking to people about how they, you know, mm-hmm. track killers at the FBI and almost every single one of them is like, why would we put ourselves in the minds of yeah. this guy? Like, no. And we, Jonathan's yeah. graph character is very much put in that like, okay, you're not a tough cop. Yes. Clearly, because yes. you want to understand them. That's not what we're here for. Right. We're just here to punish them. Right. Like we need to get this, get it, move on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. And like you mentioned, the changes in his character, then we see it from the other side. When you're not willing to listen to someone, how then they can take it so far. Well, no, I'm going to prove to you that we need to yep. look at it this side. And like you said, he's just unchecked and mm-hmm. things just... They go weird. They go weird. They go sideways. Yeah. And there's some uh, guys in here that play serial killers that are just terrifying. Terrifying. Just, and you don't see what they did. You're just in conversations with them. And the conversation it's is in, they're intense. Yeah. It's a lot. But it feels very much like, you know, there's like a got to be a manliness mm-hmm. component. And it it's almost feels like a competition as they're talking, which to me was just the epitome of all of this. Yes. You know? And now's a great time because you can catch up before the next season. I don't, yeah, when is the next season? I, I don't know. I think, it, I don't know now okay. with COVID, yeah. but I know that there's supposed to be another season, right. so I don't yeah, know. Yeah, there's been two seasons of this. Mm-hmm. Um, the first season was kind of getting that up and going. The second, there was a big focus on the Atlanta child murders, mm-hmm. which was fascinating. I'd never Very, heard about that I before. I hadn't either, no. So then I did a deep dive into a documentary on HBO about that, mm-hmm. you know, side note, and that was fascinating. But anyway, yeah, yeah it's... It's an excellent show, and yeah, you see men being men and suffering for it, honestly. Yeah. All right. Well, I went a very different direction from pop culture. Yeah. And I hesitated, but I picked this for a reason, a very specific reason. Oh, so intriguing. Uh huh. I am recommending Lego Movie 2, (laughs) (laughs) the second part. Which was, <laughs> I knew. I, <laughs> Let me say that I've never seen either one, so I just I love okay. this idea. I, right. I'm here. I'm ready. All right. I'm listening. It was in uh, released in 2019. First, to be fair, I love the Lego movies. Okay. It makes me laugh. It's mm-hmm. one of those things where I can watch it with Mason and be entertained, which okay. isn't true of a lot of oh, sure. children's movies. Yeah. Um, second, the cast. You got Chris Pratt, mm. Elizabeth Banks, Nick Offerman, Stephanie Beatrice, Ralph Fiennes, Tiffany Haddish, Kobe Smelders, Will Arnett. Net, wow. and, and more and more and more. Yeah. So, um, so at the beginning of it, and this happened in the first Lego movie, we had this narrator who is this boy playing with Legos. And in the beginning of part two, his little sister is there and she's got a Duplo Lego set, which okay. if you're not familiar with Legos, there's the little Legos, but like they came out with Duplos, which are bigger and yeah. easier for younger little kids. kids. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. And the narrator's dad is saying, look, your sister's old enough to play with Legos. Now you get to incorporate her. Because this kid has this like whole world built in the sure. basement that he's made of Legos. And he's devastated <sighs> that her stupid Legos are going to be in there. Because mm. hers are like a kitty and a oh, heart. No. And yeah, how dare your female Legos exactly. be with mine, right? Okay, so this plunges us into the pretend world that he's created with Emmett Burkowski. Who is played by Chris Pratt? Okay, and Wild Style, who is played by Elizabeth Banks. So, you, if you've seen the first one, they're the same characters, and they're under attack in their community from Duplo Legos <laughs> and Queen Sweet Mayhem, who's <gasps> voiced by Stephanie Beatrice from Oh yeah, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Nine Nine, and Queen Wannabe, who is voiced by Tiffany Haddish. Oh man. And they don't know how they're going to get out of this. The, everything's being overtaken. All the superhero Legos, like um, Superman, all them, they went off on a mission, Green Lantern, and they never returned. <laughs> and the only one that's left is Batman because he was too selfish to go on the <laughs> mission to begin with. And he's not really interested in helping with this one either. So em is, em, uh, Emmett's alter ego shows up. His name is Rex Danger Vest. Uh, oh. Also played by Chris Pratt. Okay. And essentially, he is everything that Emmett is not. Okay. He's cool. He's smooth. Oh, he gets no. the ladies. Yeah. He's like the hero. He's supposed to be the quintessential Man. super hero action guy, right? Mm-hmm. And so right off the bat, Emmett's like, oh, man, this guy is everything I wish I could be. Like, he seems great. And so he's buying in that he can't do any of these things and that it's, you know, Rex is going to have to save the day. I won't ruin it for you, but this that relationship right there is the reason that I picked it for this. Because really, you could not see a more simple version of 
the two kinds of masculinity mm-hmm. shown on a screen mm-hmm. and the struggle of, oh, I think that's what I'm supposed to be because yes. that's what society wants and what they value, but that's just not who I am. So how do I get there? And you also get to see Wild Style, Elizabeth Banks' character, that is like, I don't think that this Rex Danger Vest guy is any good. <laughs> so, but we're not listening to the females sure. saying, of that's course not, not great. Of that's not, not what everyone wants. Right. So... It plays out. It's wonderful. It's hilarious through it. There's some great (laughs) song interludes. Um, There's tons (laughs) of stuff in there for adults. But really, the reason I picked it, one, because of that illustration on screen, but two, because at the heart of our theme today, and so many of the things that we talk about, so and maybe it's just how I feel right now about 2022, but I feel like so much of this is not going to be changed if we don't start changing the way we teach and bring up our children. Yes. And this is a perfect example. Great movie. The kids love it. But it's there's also a message here about masculinity and about being yourself and that that's okay. Yeah. That it isn't always the big tough guy that gets everything and does everything right. That he's very fallible and makes mistakes as well. Mm-hmm. And as simplistic as that sounds, seeing it played out, and played out on a screen I appreciate it as a parent and I also really enjoyed the movie so there's so many times we talk about um books or picks that are showing like woman what a woman should be and Mm -hmm. how we're fighting against that thinking like well that's not who I am and maybe that's what we're trying to get at too is that Mm -hmm. toxic masculinity is like this idea of who men should be right versus who men could be if we would just teach them different if we would accept you know different definitions if we would do away with the whole thing, honestly, yes, I'm going to return yes. to that point. Yeah. Well, and it, it it it's how I feel about feminism in a way in a way too. Like I, it took me a long time in reading to understand that I'm not not a feminist if I like makeup, or I'm not not exactly. a feminist if I enjoy different clothes or whatever it is. Yeah, and it's the same is true for masculinity. Yeah. If you could get there, just because you like working out doesn't mean that that you can't be a sensitive, emotional person, or vice versa. Like we're not saying that one thing is right. We're saying that saying one thing is right for everyone yeah. is the problem, and that's what I feel like we don't you know yeah. spend enough time on we don't and really by teach putting, ever no and by prizing all of these values and behaviors as the right way to be then we're narrowing who we are as people and cutting down our ability to empathize with people that are different mm-hmm I also like it. Um, there was a review of the Lego movie too that was saying that this was like a Lego illustration play out of Chris Pratt's career. Like he started out <laughs> as like this nice guy, like Parks and Rec, you know, yes. lovable into like this superhero guy that sometimes you kind of were like, Meh. yeah, Meh. yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Me. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how you would characterize Chris yeah. Pratt? Me. Yeah, at the end in yeah. some of the stuff. Okay. I mean, yeah. if you want another example of toxic masculinity, watch Passengers. Because he legit woke oh, that lady up. That's right. Sentenced her to death because he thought she was pretty and he couldn't be alone. That's right. That's. He saw her as his property yeah. too. He's like, yeah. oh, I'm going to kill you, but ooh, yep. you get to be but with me. You get so. to love me. Surprise. And she really has no choice because no, otherwise no choice. she's just going to die. So she has to forgive him. And then him at some point, yeah, she just gives in. Mm-hmm. She's like, well, I guess it's better to not die alone. Yeah. Which is a sad oh, realization, God. right? This is terrible. Oh, that took a weird turn. It took I'm a sorry. Weird Go turn. back to Lego like Movie Two, where everything is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's our theme, and that's our episode. Any final parting thoughts? Louise is uh, silent. For a while, she was uh, battling against the box. She was. I don't know if you noticed I that. I did. But yeah, 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 yeah. There was quite a, a tussle. There was a tussle. She seemed to win for a while, she though. <laughs> so that's good. Way to battle through. I like it. I like your tenacity. <laughs> Perseverance. Thelma wants nothing to do no. with us and our podcasting. No. So she isn't even. She's like, I'm not about it. It's Louise fine. is the one that's trying to be a star, mm-hmm. trying to hitch her, you know, hitch to, her wagon to our rising comet. That's oh my god. Yeah, <laughs> I couldn't remember the phrase. I don't think that was quite it, no. but I'll go with it. I knew it was hitch your wagon. <laughs> To but, a star? Yeah. Or something? To our oh, right. To let's our go star. back to just Satan and his bootstraps. Yeah. Bootstraps and his overalls. And his <laughs> tiny hooves. You know what? We'll be back next Wednesday. And until then, happy reading. <laughs>